and welcome to Artifacts, the monthly magazine on the arts in Minneapolis, brought to you by City Cable 34. I'm Phil Lindsay, and this is a special edition of Artifacts. This month we'll be uh, adding a panel discussion. The topic this time will be on arts education. Later on we'll be talking with Kelly Shea, who's a poet and a writer and involved with Ophelia's Pale Lilies. But first, I'm pleased to introduce a gentleman I met recently, Warren Geffrey. He's the director of the Two Rivers Gallery uh, down at the uh, Minneapolis American Indian Center on Franklin Avenue. Welcome. Thanks. Pleasure Thanks for being, being here. here. Thanks. Now, I kind of entered a little bit, um, and you are involved with the Two Rivers Gallery. Can you talk a little bit about the gallery and what it's about and what you're doing with it? Okay. Um, I was hired, I guess, towards the end of January to develop a commercial gallery off-site from the Minneapolis American Indian Center. And actually, the gallery location hasn't been determined yet. I'm uh, still working on a possible location. Um, looking at the warehouse district in Minneapolis and uh, in hopes of uh, locating there and getting a broader exposure for the Native American art in the arts so community. Th this is to be an extra, an additional gallery. You're not uh, closing up the one there at the Indian Center on Franklin. Exactly right. Uh, the Tuvers Gallery that's presently at the Minneapolis American Indian Center will remain there, but the the name of the gallery will actually change to Two Rivers Cultural Arts Center, and mm -hmm. it will be more of a community-based um, um, gallery. They'll have a small exhibition gallery, and they'll have lectures and workshops and, and different classes held for um, the community artists. Okay, at, at East Franklin is what you're talking Correct. about. Correct, right. And then your new space, presumably downtown Minneapolis, yeah. That will be more of a, what I would think of as a traditional gallery with objects on the wall and, and freestanding sculptural kinds of things. Exactly, exactly. It, it'll be a, it'll carry mainly a lot of the artists that um, are not represented here in the state. Um, there's a number of artists that um, that are within the Twin Cities or within the state of Minnesota, uh, Native artists that um, actually don't have an outlet in the Twin Cities for their work. So this will be a provide a good exposure for them. And it'll also carry some regional artists as well as national artists. And um, it'll be a carry fine art gallery. We will uh, carry some jewelry. Um, and um, basically, it'll be a, a fine art gallery, I guess. Now, what motivated you, and, and I suppose you have a board or an uh, administration or something, uh, what motivated you to do a gallery downtown? OK, um, I guess because of the, the arts community, the um, the number of galleries, I guess, in the warehouse district um, would help a, a new gallery get off the ground. I guess um, having the gallery crawl that takes place uh, every six weeks in the warehouse district would help, um, I guess, provide additional exposure to the gallery, a, a new gallery de developing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the um, the location, I think, people are aware of, of the, the warehouse district. It certainly has a reputation. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a number of galleries that are located there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it'll blend in well and, and complement the galleries that are existing there. Have you, I'm sure you've given thought to uh, who you're hoping to get in the doors. There's, there's obviously an existing audience or clientele for uh, the gallery on Franklin, and, and I'm sure some of those folks will keep coming. But are you looking at new audiences, new people to come in and Exactly. Exactly. Um, with the closure of the Raven Gallery in uh, in Minneapolis, Argus Edina, um, that had left a, a, a void of, of Native American art here in the Twin Cities. And actually, there's only one gallery in St. Paul that carries more finer art um, quality of, of Indian artwork. So, this gallery here in Minneapolis will actually be um, the only fine art gallery. There are a number of smaller craft shops and outlets that persons can actually go to and buy um, Indian art or artifacts or craft work. So this, um, this will be a great exposure for the artists in, uh, in the state here within, within Minneapolis. Now, I know uh, last year there was a, a major exhibition down at the Convention Center, and this year I believe it's at the Hyatt. The Hyatt Regency. Can you talk a little bit about that and okay. who comes to that? Yeah, last year we had, um, we had a little over 12,000 people from 40 states and five foreign countries attend the market. And we had 193 artists represented from from all across the United States and Canada. And this year it'll be held at the Hyatt Regency, and we'll have right around 175 artists at the show. And there will be um, there will be um, I guess artists representing um, right around 20 states. Last year we had a little larger draw, but this year we're 
we're getting more Minnesotans in the show, so they're filling the space. And um, this year it's in collaboration with um, the Ojibwe Art Expo that's held in Bemidji State University. Okay. And um, so we have a larger, larger exposure of Minnesota artists in this market. So your work, I, just to sort of repeat, I mean, you, you connect then throughout the state of Minnesota as well as across the continent. I mean, this really puts the local effort on the national map then. Exactly. I think for years and years past, um, there hasn't really been a major emphasis on Indian art here in the Twin Cities. And there is a, there is a, a large uh, Native American population here, actually the third largest in the United States for a metropolitan area. And, um, and there needs to be more exposure for Native American art here. There Very needs true. to be more outlets. Um, there's a lot of artists out there that, um, that don't, really have the, don't really have any exposure, and this provides an opportunity for them um, to meet clientele and, and develop, um, I guess, uh, their own outlets for their work. So, and this gallery will blend, will add to that, will complement the, the market that takes place. Now, you were kind enough to bring a few uh, photos here of some of the work, and uh, if we can zoom in on this and get a sense of what this is, and if uh, I realize that these aren't all necessarily pieces that you actually represent, but examples of some of the things that might be there. Exactly. This is um, of an artist. Uh, her name is Paponi. Her Indian name is Paponi. And her name is Barbara Elston. She's a Kansas Kickapoo artist, and she does ceramic, uh, ceramic work. Well, this is striking here. Yeah. And, and this that. is, uh, yeah. and I'm not sure the name of the art, this artist here, but. Um, Do you know what is that material? That looks like stone. Right. It's I believe it's like Utah alabaster, or Colorado it's alabaster. Beautiful. Now this may this be hard for a camera to pick up the detail, but it's really fine. This is a sterling silver ball that um, was cast, and this is done by an artist named Howard Sykes. Hold on to that Howard for a Sykes. second. That's uh, quite impressive. Yeah. Well, this, this is, is fun. Um, yeah, this is um, uh, this is a piece done by uh, Randall Blaze. He's an artist from Oregon that was at our market last year. Mm -hmm. And this one is Pat McAllister. And she's an artist that's from Arkansas. And, um, Do you know the medium there? That, uh, that's oil. That is oil. It is oil. Do you have any sense? I know it's just a photograph here. How large is the original? Is that a? Actually, I, it's 16 by 20. Well, you just happen to yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good one. I didn't mean okay. to put you in the spot. No, that's fine. That's a striking image right yeah. there. Yeah. Um, is it a matter sometimes where Minnesota artists, local artists, are better known elsewhere than in their own hometown or their home state? Yeah, that seems to be the case, um, and we hope to change that and have the artists um, that actually have to go or feel they have to go outside this region to be represented in the galleries or, or travel to other markets to sell their work. Um, they can stay here, and, and hopefully with this gallery, the promotions through the gallery and, um, and the representation they have and, and also the market um, should provide good outlet, outlets for their work. So. Well, the, uh, the gallery on Franklin has been a great contributor to that here so far over the years. Exactly. And I think the new effort you're doing is, is really commendable. We've only got another minute or so, but I wanted to find out a little bit about Warren Geffrey, the person. Okay. How did you get into all this? Okay. What's your background with the arts? Are you an artist yourself? Or? No, I'm actually not an artist. Um, and uh, I've tried various mediums, but nothing seemed to work. So, But uh, my, my exposure for art, I've lived in um, the Southwest and actually worked in galleries in Santa Fe. And it stemmed from that, and also the development of a nonprofit um, American Indian Art Organization in St. Paul, um, and else and developing this market um, was, I guess, a major effort for our organization. And um, and then I was recently hired, I guess, as director of Two Rivers Gallery to develop a retail art gallery for them. Wow! And Congratulations, uh, and I consider this a, a real gain and a real boost for the the local art world. I appreciate you coming by and sharing this. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, thanks. Warren. Great. Now, we'll be back in a moment with uh, Kelly Shea, but first there's this interesting art fact we thought you might like to take a look at. Welcome back to the next segment of Artifacts, and I'm very pleased to have as a guest Kelly Shea, who I was about to introduce as a poet, but I'm not so sure that's the right thing to say. Mm, don't say that. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Now, but you work with people who write poetry. Right, and I do um, 
tried to do it myself. But I've never been very comfortable with, with things like, oh, you know, when you meet someone and they say, I'm a poet or I'm an artist, or I don't think that's necessarily a title you can give yourself. It's more like something you earn after okay. a certain amount of time. And part of the way you're earning it and helping a lot of folks earn it is through a publication and a series of readings right. that I know as Ophelia's Pale Lilies. Right. Can you talk a little bit about Ophelia's Pale Lilies? And you want to know how it got started how and why started, and things like yeah. that? Well, I moved to uh, Minneapolis about six years ago, and all my training is in theater. And so I moved here after I graduated from college and started working for the Guthrie and freelancing at different theaters around town. And I found that they'd always say, well, yeah, we need you to work on this project. And money? Well, there's no money, but it'd look really good on your resume kind of thing. So you end up with a great resume and no yeah. money. And after a while, you think, well, if I'm going to be working for free for all these people, why not do it for myself? But theater's kind of a hard thing to do by yourself unless you want to go out on a soapbox somewhere because you need lights and other people to interact with and all that. So um, over a bottle of wine one night, talking with a friend of mine, we said, why don't we just start a group for people who feel creative and want to work on things but don't necessarily have somewhere to do it. So we started meeting at the Loring Bar twice a week. And we put flyers up around town that said, you know, writers, painters, sculptors, musicians, anyone who wants to come, here's kind of like a support group and you can all sit around and talk about your projects and someone can say, well, that doesn't sound very like it's a good idea or that sounds like it's a really good idea. And oh, it's been two years now and it's sort of evolved to be just mainly writers. Uh, but it started out very informally, just yeah. anybody who showed up. and Definitely. And it, it still is that way. Anybody can come. We'll have um, someone come in and say, well, I don't write, but I just want to sit and listen to you guys talk. It's like, sure. And they can throw in their opinions and comment about things. Or it can be someone who um, is an actor who wants to work on their voice and wants to read things. So they'll come in and bring, you know, some T.S. Eliot and sit there and just read it. And we'll just kind of listen, you know. It's just nice to and listen to people And feedback if you want things. to. Yeah. Interesting. And out of that grew, so we got these people on, and they're writing things, right? And then they'll send them off to publications, reject, reject, reject. So mm. we said, well, why don't we just publish them ourselves? Oh, duh, yeah, good idea. So we started publishing them ourselves. Why don't you hold up what you've yeah. got? This is one of a number of, I would call it a broadsheet. Right, that's yeah. what we call it. It's a broadsheet. It's a legal size. And I always did these at Kinko's. And uh, now I have a computer at home. Oh, and so you're so self-published now. Yeah, so I do them at home. But the thing is, I, you know, it's real rudimentary. It's cut and paste. It's copy machine. And um, pay for them myself unless I can get other people to give me money every now and then. Someone will go, well, here's some money towards that. You know, and different people in the group chip their money in to pay for it. So the support it. is informal as well then? Totally. Kind I have never gotten uh, a grant or any money for it. And I don't charge for them. And I probably do five to 700 a month. And they're distributed um, at you know different places around town, um, coffee shops and bars and bookstores. Now, are there a lot of places that say, "Yeah, drop them off here"? Mm -hmm. Are there a lot of people picking up these five? What'd you say, six hundred? Well, it's like five to seven. Depends on how much money I have. Some months I've only run two or three hundred, and I'm like, "Oh man," I, but I don't have any money to do more. So those will be the valuable ones someday because there were less <laughs> printed. <right? laughs> yeah, that's the ticket. Last month I did nine hundred of them. So you're a little more flush that month. Yeah, well, someone gave me 20 bucks in a bar one night. Because they knew you were doing well, this they, they, poetry no, thing? No, um, they, they saw it and they go, wow, where, where do you get the money for this? And I said, well, I do it myself. Blah, 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 blah. So just oh, spontaneous wow. contribution? Yeah. Some, I was like, cool. I actually have an Ophelia's Pale Lilies checkbook. You do? So yeah. this is starting to get a little official now. Well, you see, it's no minimum balance required. Oh, I see. <laughs> where do you want to take those. this? Uh, I mean, it sounds um, like uh, people coming together, kind of filling in a need, and... Uh, yeah, it's, um, okay, I'll finish this part, this little tangent really quick, then we'll go off on the, uh, on the other okay. tangent. So it went from the group of people meeting twice a week, now we meet once a week. We meet Saturday mornings at 12.30. And I say it's morning, some people say it's afternoon. The Loring Bar. You no, know, what is more? I mean, we have a reality question here. What is morning? Um, it's post-noon. It's 12.30 af in, in the afternoon. And that's your morning? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was just straight with that. And, okay, so we do that. We do the publication every month. There's a P.O. box, and you'll flash the address for that later, we right, that people can send submissions to. Okay. And we also do readings um, the third Tuesday of every month at the Loring Bar and then at different venues around town. So that's how this all got started. But it's taking, ended up taking kind of different tangents in that um, 
It was related to some question you just asked before. Well, just where do you want to take this? Oh, where do I want to take it? Yeah. yeah. I've been finding that um, I've been getting asked to come to different high schools and to talk about it and to talk with high school kids about their writing and their work. And I've done that at uh, St. Louis Park and also at Edison. And um, I was just talking to a, a guest that's going to be coming on. On this show later? Later, Bill Slack. Well, Artifacts, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. he's with the Center for Arts Education. Yeah, and he's asked me to come out there and look around there and talk to him. And then I've been doing work with, well, you've heard about the Homeless Project. St. Stephen's published Homeless Poetry and a group yes. in Chicago did. Inadvertently, I've gotten involved with um, halfway homes for mentally ill people. Here in Minneapolis? In Minneapolis. And so I've had um, a couple people come to the group, really great writers and stuff that, um, have been going through different treatments for um, emotional and psychological needs. And I've gotten asked if I, if I would get into that some more. And I would maybe go into some of these halfway houses and encourage people to write. So in other words, solicit their working on it. And one of the uh, reaction I have is that you're very grassroots, not only in how you find the poets or the poetry and that sort of thing, but where you take it. And, going into the schools and the halfway houses and the homeless shelters. It, it's not like I'm, I'm not really on a crusade about it. And mm -hmm. if I really had my choice, I'd you know, maybe not do it at all. It's just something in, inside me says, I have to do this. Or people come and ask me. Mm -hmm. And I really don't want to say no. Because if what I really believe in is people working out their creativity and my working out my creativity, then I'd really be a jerk if I said, no, I don't want to do that, or no, that takes too much time. Now, so some of your writing shows up in this as well, and, and yeah. you stand at the microphone and, and yeah, read I do, as well. I do, and I used to do it a lot more. I'm, I'm. When you read a lot of other people's work, and I read constantly, it's my favorite thing to do. You know, I'm always reading, right? Mm -hmm. And then you write something yourself, and you put it in with all this. I get really, really insecure about it. My my work I did in theater, I was always fine with. I mean, I'm fine with yabbling in front of people. But really? when it, yeah, <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> but when it comes to to writing stuff myself and having someone hold my words and read it, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh man, this is really puts you bad. in a different oh, yeah. category there. Yeah. No, I, I don't know how many more minutes we've got, but I want to get to some other things. But before we do, I want to make sure that we get a chance to hear yeah. you read somebody's uh, piece that you brought. Yeah, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm not reading my stuff today. Okay. <laughs> now you said um, you talked to this fellow and yeah, uh, the, uh, okay. the man whose uh, piece I'm going to read his name is Andrew Miller, and he's been a part of OPL, which is what. We call Ophelia's 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 mm -hmm. since the beginning. Okay. And uh, this is called Grieving Day. Once in a while on Tuesdays, I have Grieving Day with my friends. We come together with love letters, postcards, matchbooks, and hats. Tattered remnants and tired photos pass through shaking hands and tears. She misses her mother, her brother, and sons. He wants back that one real love. We sob and cry, shake and hold hands, and stamp our feet and scream until the trees begin to quake, and the ground swells and splits open like a birthing gate, and the mountains rise up jagged like teeth, and the sun falls and the stars flash, and the wind moans until the oceans rear back and rage. With the grief of our loss of love, our will for life, and our unyielding doubt of faith. Then we take deep breaths, fold up the poems and faded blue letters, sweaters of a dead guy and earrings from a corpse, and we walk out into another gray, rainy Tuesday. And that was written by Andrew Miller. Pretty powerful. Yeah, he's great. And uh, this is a guy that's applied to a number of graduate schools for uh, their writing programs because he wants to continue his writing, and he keeps getting rejected. And I think the guy is great. So OPL is where he comes to work on his stuff. And he'd be an example of somebody who could come to one of your events and possibly hear or, or read it in the, uh, in the broadsheet. Yeah, he's been published in the broadsheet, and he does read at our readings. But the last thing I want to say before we stop is that anyone is welcome to come. That's what this is about. It doesn't matter how old you are and, and, um, and what you write and what your level is. Anyone's welcome. Kelly, it's fascinating. I think we'll keep hearing about Ophelia's Pale Lilies. Well, I hope so. And quickly, when do you have your readings? Um, the readings are the third Tuesday of every month at the Loring Bar. We have one coming up April 21st, which is an open mic. Okay. And the 6.30 sign-up, 7 o'clock show. Great. And we'll be flashing on the screen uh, a post office box that people can send submissions to. Submissions to, too. right. And this is really low-key. So you might not hear from me for three months if you send a submission. You're not going to get any money. 
So okay. I'll warn you. But the mailbox is open. Yeah. Thanks for being a guest. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. OK, now we're going to try a new segment here on uh, artifacts. Um, the arts are often in the news. Scandals and controversy have certainly made the news in the past couple of years. But there are, of course, previews, reviews, news stories of major developments or initiatives, letters to the editor, human interest stories, even obituaries about performers, teachers, or entrepreneurs in the arts, and of course, editorials. We thought we would uh, perhaps uh, show you a few sample headlines from uh, last month in the local press. It's not meant to be a complete uh, recap, but just a few examples. The political and artistic worlds continued to clash last month, ever since the so-called NEA controversy grabbed headlines a couple of years ago. There's been a twilight battle for control of the NEA when Republican presidential candidate Pat Buchanan successfully challenged George Bush from the right. The president pressured the NEA chair, uh, John Fronmeyer, to resign. The Star Tribune ran both an editorial and a column condemning this action. City Page has also included a column on the current climate at the NEA. The Real Estate Journal ran a long uh, front page story on visual art in major uh, new buildings in downtown Minneapolis. The AT&T Tower, the Dane Bosworth Plaza, and the LaSalle Plaza were highlighted in that article. Straight news stories included an article in the Star Tribune about NEA grants to Minneapolis arts organizations and to individual artists. Three writers and a jazz musician received funds. The Star Tribune also announced the winners of the 18th annual Minnesota Association of Dance Lines state competition. Interestingly, there's also been a move recently to have the State High School League declare dance lines a sport. There are critics who claim that doing so would allow schools to declare one more girls sport without making any real commitment of resources to achieve parity between boys and girls sports. As often covered in the art section of the Sunday Star Tribune, a preview of a major exhibition gave significant coverage to a local artist. Over 40 column inches gave an in-depth background both to Minneapolis artist Tom Rose and his exhibition, Mercies and Reason, on view currently at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. That'll be up through April 19th. A letter to the editor early last month joined in the controversy over whether and how the Postal Service should commemorate the memory of rock and roll star Elvis Presley. Now, while there are some who might argue that Presley wasn't an artist, the stamp would be designed by an artist. And in any case, the tempest over this Tupelo twanger has not in itself been artful. Now, I mentioned obituaries. It was the frequent notice of the death of beloved music teachers or movie actors or choir directors that first caught my interest in what uh, gets covered in the arts. Political figures, people in business, the notorious and cultural folk seem to be whom we memorialize. When the owner of the Red Wing Pottery Place Factory Outlet Center died this winter, it was noticed in a prominent obit in the Star Tribune. And finally, the Shooting Back program in South Minneapolis, which involves youth in learning the basics of photography and who then document the world around them, was the subject of a long human interest piece in the Star Tribune. Now, last September, you may remember, we interviewed Lisa Freeman of the University of Minnesota Press, which published Jim Hubbard's book, American Refugees. It was his Washington, D.C.-based shooting back program that inspired the local effort. So those are a few samples of some of the things that get covered on a monthly basis uh, in the local press. Now, in a moment, we'll be back with uh, our panel to discuss uh, arts education. But first, we're going to resurrect the artifacts question. And now for the artifacts question of the month. What were the three American cities in 1991 that provided the most local government arts support? If you know the answer to this question and would like to win a fabulous arts prize, call the City Cable 34 hotline at 673-2234. Hello and welcome back. Now this is our new segment in Artifacts in which we're going to have a panel discussion about a topic that I think is of great importance to folks that are interested in the arts in Minneapolis and indeed in Minnesota. Uh, a few months ago as a guest we had Setu Jones who's working with the Minneapolis schools and the Walker Arts Center. I asked him a question about arts education and he kind of stopped and before he answered he said, Phil, you know, we could talk about that for an hour. So I took that as kind of a cue and I thought, well, maybe we should have a serious discussion about that at some later point and, and talk about some of the issues of arts education. So recently I made a few calls to a few colleagues and friends and asked them if they would come and sit and talk with, with us for a few minutes about some of the issues that relate to arts education. I'm pleased to introduce some of these people to you now. We have Chris Wanker, 
who uh, is an arts education advocate and works at General Mills. Janet Grove, who's a longtime supporter of the arts and arts education, who's with the Minnesota Alliance for Arts and Education, and we'll talk about some of your programs later. Holly Schramm, who's a dancer, choreographer, and dance educator. I think I got all those titles. And then Bill Slack, whom I get to know when he was on the Minneapolis Arts Commission, but he's also an artist, um, a very talented artist, I might say. And you teach out at the Minnesota Center for Arts Education. Right. So welcome. Thanks to you all for coming. Um, as I mentioned, I think that uh, arts education is really crucial for the arts and also for the future of Minnesota education in general. And I thought we might start with a couple of definitions. And Janet, I thought I'd start with you. Could you give us a little overview about what do we mean by arts education or arts in education? Um, oftentimes it's a kind of a controversial question, but um, arts education is the study of the arts. Um, we look at the alliance, we look at music, theater, visual arts, media arts, dance, and creative writing or literary arts as the arts that, um, that we believe should be in the schools and available to all the students. Um, Arts can be taught on their own and in their own subjects. Um, you have a visual art teacher who teaches visual arts. You have a media arts teacher who is dealing with cameras and production and theater, um, teaching about theater plays, about um, theater um, history, etc. Arts in education is the study of those topics in the curriculum at large. Um, that would mean that when you're studying so social studies, for example, um, you may look at the Renaissance period and you would study the music and the theater and the dance in terms of the history of the Renaissance. Um, in addition, you'd study what was happen happening politically and historically and socially, um, but the arts would be a framing for that or could be part of that study. Um, as Subjects are, as we're learning more and teachers are being cut and programs are being cut, we're finding more and more that people are interested in finding ways to integrate the arts into the classroom, into the other subjects. And so I think that um, we hope not to the detriment of teaching the arts as viable and really important subjects on their own, but that that will also allow more students to become part of them and perhaps then gain the interest to then take an arts class or a music class separately. Well, you mentioned that there's been some controversy and, and, and with the curriculum-based uh, outcomes that people are trying to get. Maybe we'll get to some of those issues in a bit. I know a few years ago, um, an initiative, a major initiative, was the creation of what we call the Arts High School or the Center for Arts Education that Bill teaches at. Could you tell us a little bit, Bill, about what that center is and maybe what you do there and some of the other teachers? Okay, well, uh, all of the disciplines that Janet just mentioned are disciplines that are areas of study at the Arts High School. Uh, there's approximately 250 students. They're selected from throughout the state. In fact, we just finished our uh, reviews for this year for the class coming in in the fall. Um, it's an outcome-based education system, and I always like to think of us as a laboratory. Um, we, we're interdisciplinary. You know, you talked about arts and education, and uh, that, that is indeed our focus. There is a, uh, through your science class, through your world languages, uh, there is an arts component that, that is part of that. So that as you go through your inquiry process, you you go through it from the viewpoint of an artist it's, and and it's it's student centered um, and it's it, no two days are ever the same it's just it's i like being around a group of extremely talented young people and how old are these youngsters students there are juniors and seniors so we're talking about 16 17 18 year olds okay and they come from around the state they're 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 from all over the state uh, i just got back from mankato this weekend Okay, and, and that was what, an outreach? Uh, that was a review. We reviewed uh, probably 60 or 70 students in all the disciplines while we were there. In that area alone? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you go around other parts of the state? And right. So there's a lot of interest in the school? There is, and interest is growing. All of the disciplines, uh, the students applying, are the, the numbers are increasing. They increase with each year. Uh, the visual art department has always been probably a third of the student body. Mm -hmm. And it continues to Sounds grow. Sounds like a popular program. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, now, speaking of disciplines, uh, it's been my impression that not all the disciplines get the same kind of coverage or uh, resources throughout the state. And one of the reasons I was glad that Holly could join us is that you're particularly interested in dance. Yeah. And I'm not a dancer and don't have that background, but can you tell me a little bit about the state of dance education in Minnesota schools or in education? Um, well, I think one of the biggest issues right now that I'm concerned with in dance and education is that it is not certified in the state. So as a, as a dance educator, having a degree um, in a BS, uh, BS in dance education, I cannot go and teach in the public school system. Now you say you have that degree? Yeah. Yes, but, but with it, that doesn't give you a credential to take to, that into To be schools. a public school teacher. Okay. No, because it's not certified in the state. And until that occurs, um, people like myself would not be able to just get a regular teaching job in, right. unless, unless I got a job at some place like the Arts High School. Right. And presumably which, there are dance teachers out there at this point. Yes, right? yeah. But yeah. that sounds kind of exceptional. Yeah, very exceptional. And or else um, they do make exceptions in other school, but then you might you're not getting all the perks or the benefits. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're lacking. You're just getting, you know, your hourly wage or and um, you know no tenure. Or right, so you're jobbed in, essentially. Right. Yeah. Now, when I was yes. young, any dance that we had, if we had any, was in Phi Ed. Uh -huh. Is that where kids today tend to get? Pri dance? Primarily Phi Ed, yeah. yeah. Which is which is a great great place to get it. Um, as an educator, my focus is to integrate dance with other curriculums. So I go in and try to reach out to the other, you know, dance history, um, art, English, math, um, agriculture, anything, and teach those subjects through movement because I guess I don't believe every child is uh, an academic learner. There's, there's a lot of kids who are just more. Well, my sense is that not everybody is visually oriented right, or orally right. oriented and some may have movement as their primary yeah, mode of expression. So Janet's example, if I think you said the Renaissance or something, yeah, that might be an area example. that if, if that was the curriculum you could go in and explore the dance in that historical period mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. some what that might have meant culturally and socially and things like that. Correct, yes. World cultures. Mm -hmm. Now, Chris, I attended a, an Alliance for Arts and Education conference a couple years ago. I think you were on the board of that organization at the time. Yes, I was. And uh, frankly, I forget what the, the topic was in general, but, but you spoke up rather passionately, I thought, about the value of arts education to the business community, to the business world. And I thought I'd ask you if you could share a little bit about your thoughts about that. Certainly. Well, I think, first of all, if you listen to some of the central themes that are coming out of American business nationwide, things like the need to be more innovative, um, to be able to be quicker in putting out a new product or making a shift in your business strategy, those kinds of things, and, and the, the corollaries that go along with that, um, problem solving across the whole organization, the ability to work together as teams, um, workplace diversity, all those kinds of themes. You can quickly see that a liberal arts background um, could contribute to all of those sorts of kinds of things we're trying to foster in the business world today. Um, talking more specifically, my company is a consumer products marketing driven company and um, we need to be aware of different cultures, different ways of learning to get our advertising messages across, to uh, structure those messages so that we are as effective selling to a population in the southwestern United States as in the northeastern United States. We also have a restaurant business, and a restaurant doing business in New York might not do exactly the same things with their local marketing efforts as a restaurant in Florida. And that requires the same sort of full-bodied knowledge of the world around us, the same sort of interest in all different kinds of ways of communicating your business message and learning about your customer. And I think liberal arts is the perfect fit. When I hear with General Mills, which is known as a pretty forward-thinking corporation and, and a local supporter of many good causes here in the Twin Cities, how common is the attitude that you just expressed, though, in the larger corporate world? And I don't know if there's a difference locally here in the Minneapolis area or around the country. Well, unfortunately, you've got a local kid here who's, who's worked for General Mills as her, as her one and only employer, so I'm afraid I can't speak to you mm. other than my belief for other companies. I know that the belief in a liberal arts education is very broadly held. Uh, at General Mills. And um, just think about the kinds of people that you have working together in our building. Um, if we're working on a um, new product, for example, that involves packaging, 
and we've got people with a visual arts background contributing to that. The marketing side of it, which will bring communication skills, marketing skills, probably a liberal arts background and a master's, you know, master's in business. Uh, you've got operations people that probably have drawn from all sorts of skills. Um, you're going to have market research people that have got to figure out just exactly how to communicate your product message to a very disparate um, national audience. And all these people are going to come together with their set area of expertise to get that product out there and to be successful. See, to me that makes a lot of sense, that you bring this broad uh, sort of cross-disciplinary understanding to, to your task, and that would probably be true in a lot of sectors, not just the corporate world, but I service industries so. and whatever. Uh, it seemed in the 70s we tended to crank out of our higher education uh, system a lot of specialists, whether it be MBAs or whatever, and I wonder if a little broader uh, liberal arts background might not be of benefit. It sounds interesting. I believe that it is. It's good to hear that message. Janet, I wanted to ask a, a general question, anybody else that has a thought on this. What are we doing right in Minnesota with arts education, and what are some of the challenges that we're up against right now? Well, we've always been um, known as a leader in arts education, and I think we've um, to our detriment maybe have become caught up in that and let some things fall um, because we've always been considered that we're leaders and people have looked to Minnesota as leaders. Um, there are some good programs. Um, one of the programs is the Comprehensive Arts Planning Program, which is a program funded by the legislature, um, has been in existence for 10 years now and is run as a partnership between the Department of Education, the um, uh, Minnesota State Arts Board, the Minnesota Alliance, and now the Center for Arts Education is the fourth partner in that. Um, that is a program that goes out to any school district in this state is open to apply for that. We've, um, it's a program of long-range arts education planning, teaches people in all of the arts, K through 12, how to plan, how to put the programs in place. Um, and we've reached 141 school districts out of 400 in this state in that program. Um, and it still is a national model. We've just finished a publication that is in great demand across the nation. You brought a copy. Right. Um, you show that to us it's here. It's the Minnesota Comprehensive Planning, and it's a guide. It asks people questions if you're interested in a comprehensive program. Do you have these things in place? Can you find these? It goes through our program, helps them adapt it to maybe what might be in their state available. And this is going out to I, all I noticed the you, uh, you, you color-coded the uh, cover with your outfit here today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this one, too. Oh, I see. Um, an arts background helps there. So CAP is a partnership <laughs> that has statewide, kind of district-by-district right. district implications. Um, and as I think some of the some of the cuts that are happening through the legislature, which is very geared to many of the programs, like through the Department of Education, where we've lost a couple of arts specialists and have no hope, probably, of getting any more arts specialists, um, what the Alliance is finding is that it is at that grassroots level, that that is where the exciting things that are happening, and that those, we need the grassroots and the local people to become arts education advocates so that as some of these formal positions and clock hours are eliminated through outcome-based education, um, there's no longer going to be this body of people that says you must have 90 hours in this subject and 60 hours in this subject in the arts. We're going to have to build at that grassroots level and it's programs like CAP and like the arts curriculum expertise through the State Arts Board um, and I know Holly's been part of that. Um, those types of programs that are partnerships and that go to the grassroots are really going to be the ones that are going to survive and are going to make the difference. Right, you're right. We've got just a minute or two left. I wondered, are there any burning issues that anybody is concerned about, things on the horizon that uh, are on your mind? Mine is, is um, it's very exciting, these, these programs that are available now, like ACE Arts Curriculum Expertise, and how many schools are developing curriculums to suit their own school's needs in dance and music and um, many other art, arts areas. Uh, my concern is um, the, te the existing teachers are getting spread too thin because they're the ones who are being asked to teach these um, areas where I'm going in as a consultant to help them write curriculum. Um, they're not having someone who's necessarily 
as educated in dance education as myself or and others um, to teach it. So you're um, a little stress level yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and teachers, I feel, already have, you know, enough. They're spread th as thin as as it is, and then they're being asked to even, you know, do more. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I'm very pleased that there are these teachers who want to do this. There, it's, you know, that's the exciting part. But okay, well, thanks. Um, before we go, Bill, if people wanted uh, their children, their high school students, to know more about the school, how do they get in touch? Uh, it's five nine one forty seven hundred. Um, Sharon Jasa is head of, the, of the, the arts component of the Arts High School, but that number will get you uh, information in general. General contact. Right. Why don't you, for our uh, viewers, once again, slowly, what is that number? Okay, it's 591, it's area code 612-591-4700, and uh, they can always come out and visit. Sounds good. Golden Valley. Golden Valley. Okay. And one last thing, I know that the Alliance for Arts and Education has a conference coming up. Mm -hmm. Time and place? June 12th, um, Friday, at the Landmark Center in St. Paul. And kind of tying with all these national and local education reforms, America 2000, Minnesota 2000, um, our conference is entitled Arts 2000, Reforming Education Through the Arts. And we're bringing in a national speaker who will challenge, and he's very provocative, um, will challenge the audience to make sure that the arts are central to all the education reform that is happening across the nation and locally. Great, that's in June. June. Okay, thanks. Thanks to you all for being here, talking about arts education. Um, Susan Vaughn is the arts education specialist at the Minnesota Department of Education. She also happens to be a member of the Minneapolis Arts Commission, and we asked her if she would say a few words about arts education. Bill, because the arts are truly valued in Minnesota public schools, we feel it's really important to make certain that students are not only taught about the arts, but we know something about what they've learned. Minnesota is taking a prominent national image in terms of evaluation in this country. For instance, we've developed two compact discs of music excerpts that are being used throughout the public schools of Minnesota for testing. These are excerpts that were given free of charge by companies, including the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and the Minnesota Orchestra, for use for testing. Also in arts education or art education, we are developing 100 slides of art from prominent galleries and museums in Minnesota so that students can learn about the art of their own state and have an opportunity later to take field trips and learn more about those arts experiences. We are also using testing in the arts to help local school districts make comparisons about what students are learning and how well they're doing. And I think this is where the real impact of arts education evaluation will take hold. For instance, if kids do really well on a test in the area of identification of some of the art from our state galleries, we'll know that we're making a good head road uh, into what's happening in the museums and galleries in Minnesota. Or if the students are learning a great deal about Dominic Argento or Libby Larson's work because they're living live composers in our own state, then we'll know we're making a headway into that market as well. And we think also by testing in the arts, the arts will become more visible and prominent for the schools in Minnesota. It won't be a forgotten discipline. Uh, last point is that by testing in the arts, we'll know what specific areas we need to be focusing in on the future and where we need to train our teachers and where we need to train our parents and the public in the future as well. Well, thank you, Susan. She was uh, taped for that little segment there at Orchestra Hall in downtown Minneapolis. And I might point out that they have an extensive arts education program for young people through there as well. So I hope you like this special expanded version of the show. If you did, call in. We've got the Artifacts hotline here at City Cable 34 673 2234. I think that number will be on the screen. If you didn't like the number, call home and tell them about it, okay? <laughs>